Good morning, once again. So glad we can worship God together. Those of you who've joined us, glad you're here. Those of us who've stuck around, glad you did. Great to see Jay and Morgan and Joshua with us. First time uh, back at the assembly with the new little one. So glad to have them in our presence. And to have the cradle roll growing. That's, that's awesome. Amen. Uh, there are people, I don't need to tell you this, you know this, there are people who spend their whole lives taking advantage of the vulnerability of others. There are people who scan, looking for somebody who has nobody who needs help in order to take advantage of them. Like the man in the story, or the parable that Jesus gives us, we know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. There are those who do things like see a man traveling alone from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they beat him and strip him and take all of his stuff and leave him half dead on the side of the road. That happens all the time. Scammers, telemarketers, swindlers. We know these people and they're well known to us. Throughout history, though, there's probably no group of people more vulnerable than orphans and widows. For our purposes, looking at the second chapter of Ruth, we're going to focus on widows but consider, if you will, in the ancient world where there are no safety nets, there are no pensions, there is no social security. As far as we know, they're not the kind of charities that exist today. Many would capitalize on the vulnerability of those who had nobody else, whether they be widows or orphans. Jesus spoke of those who, out of greed, devour widows' houses. In Luke chapter 20, verse 47, those who would steal what little widows had left. With this in mind, we might go to the Bible and ask the question, who will protect the widow who's left without children, without a husband? And when we open the Word of God, the answer to that question of who will help those who have nobody, the answer to that question is God himself. In fact, we get this great insight into the nature of God in Psalm 68, verse number 5, that father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. When God gave the law of Moses, he made provisions for how to take care of widows and orphans. The prophets called Israel to repent many times for their mistreatment of widows in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Malachi. The Bible's clear. The people who have nobody have God. With this in mind, we're going to turn to Ruth chapter 2. Hope you will in your Bibles. Ruth chapter 2. Keeping in mind that those who have nobody have God helping them. And we're going to be looking at the major theme of the power of divine protection from Ruth chapter 2. Last week, we looked at the power of steadfast love from Ruth chapter 1. And now we're moving on to divine protection. We're going to notice in the first 13 verses of Ruth chapter 2, in the first place, the providence of divine protection. The providence of divine protection. And we'll unpack a little bit about what that means in a second. But if you're there in Ruth chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse number 1. Now Naomi, that's Ruth's mother-in-law, who is a widow herself. Ruth is a widow as well. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. Remember, that was Naomi's husband. So this man is related to Naomi through law. This man's name was Boaz. Verse number 2, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Though a Moabite, Ruth was probably familiar with the laws of Moses, which was the law of the land in Bethlehem, that provided that when somebody had a field, they left areas to be gleaned by the sojourner and the widow, and Ruth, of course, was both. Notice beginning there in the next verse, and she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened, literally in Hebrew, her chance chanced upon to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Scholars say this is the most important book in the book of, most important verse in the book of Ruth. This sets up the entire rest of the story. And in fact, the biblical writer here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is using a rhetorical device to bring people's attention to God. It's not just chance, it's not just happenstance. What are the odds that Ruth just goes out to glean and gleans in the field of a man who's related to her through law, through Naomi? 
Verse number four, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Literally, to whom does she belong? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves of the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Notice how hard Ruth is working. She knows that her livelihood and her mother-in-law's livelihood depends upon how much she can glean in these fields. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Notice that Boaz is showing the loyalty to Ruth that Ruth showed to her mother-in-law Naomi. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Remember, Israelites and Moabites, especially at this time, did not have a good relationship. So for this man, really to show the love and care of God to Ruth meant a lot to her. Verse 11, notice Boaz's answer. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land to come to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Notice how Boaz saw his field. Notice how Boaz saw the things that belonged to him. Boaz didn't see it as himself blessing Ruth. He saw it as God blessing Ruth through him. Everything Boaz had, he saw as an opportunity to use to bless others and give the glory to God. And we see that here where he says, The Lord give you refuge. You came to flee, not in the fields of Boaz, you came to flee under the wings of the Lord God Almighty. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Notice how God is working through Boaz. The main uh, lesson we want to get here as we think about the providence of divine protection is this. God works through circumstances and people. God works through circumstances and people. This section of the book of Ruth, Ruth 2, 1 through 13, is drenched with the providence of God. What does that mean? And really, you see it here in Root chapter, sorry, verse number um, three, where it says she happened to come to a part of the field belonging to Boaz. It's a rhetorical statement drawing attention to the providence of God. The Jews did not believe in chance. We read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. They had a view of God that God really was supreme and God really was sovereign over the universe. And God could use everything at his disposal, including people, including time, including circumstances and situations, to use for his purposes, for his glory. And we see that in the book of Ruth. God is arranging the right time in the right place with the right people to do what he wants to accomplish. When happenstance is too huge, when coincidence is too consequential, we must open our eyes to the providence of God. That God, not in the miraculous way, but working behind the scenes, using his omnipotence and his omnipresence and his omniscience, he is divinely orchestrating circumstances through the free will decisions of others to accomplish his purposes. He never told Boaz to let Ruth glean in her field. He did through the law of Moses. But he didn't come down and said, Boaz, there's this woman named Ruth. You have to take care of her. But God set it up so that Ruth would end up in Boaz's field. One commentator said this, Ruth's chance arrival at the field of Boaz is providential on two accounts. First, Boaz was a gracious man in whose eyes Ruth could find favor. Verse number 10. Second, he was from the same clan as Ruth's deceased father-in-law. In order for the divine agenda to be fulfilled, both elements had to be present. Naomi doesn't know, Ruth doesn't know, Boaz doesn't know, but God knew. And what a wonderful lesson for us when it looks like we're in dire straits. Ruth doesn't know where her next meal's coming from. She doesn't know if the field she goes to, if they're going to kick her out or if they're going to let her glean. Nonetheless, does she figure out 
Or did she know that she was going to glean in the field of a man who could redeem her and marry her and have children with her? And we're going to unpack that later in the chapters to come. But what a wonderful reminder that in those situations where we don't know what the future holds, that God still does. And he's working through the everyday things, the mundane things, the things we take for granted to accomplish his purposes, to do his will. Ruth had nothing but a mother-in-law and a willingness to work, and God did the rest. Ruth didn't pull herself up by her bootstraps. She had to be compliant. She had to go. She had to work. But God set this appointment up between her and Boaz. And notice how God does it. He doesn't come down from heaven with loaves of bread. He doesn't whisper in her ear and tell her where to go. Just like a maestro conducting a symphony, God does so. Conducting a symphony of time and place and people to give those who love him what they need. What's the lesson for us if we break it down practically? Don't be surprised if when you pray and ask God for something, God answers your prayer through people and situations. Maybe you've noticed that in your own prayer life, in your own life, where you pray for God. Ruth is hungry, praying to God for bread. He doesn't send bread from heaven, but he gives her, sets her up with a field to glean from and a godly man who runs the field. If we trust God, if we have a willingness to work like Ruth did, if we ask him to have favor on us, Ruth, the book of Ruth tells us he will act on our behalf just like he did for Ruth. God often takes care of his people through others taking care of his people. And we need to accept that help. There's a story about two people who were snowmobiling and uh, actually they were going ice fishing in the Great White North, somewhere in northern Michigan, Canada. And they're going to this place to go ice fishing. And while they're doing so, a great blizzard comes. And it's a whiteout. And they can't even see their hand in front of their face. And they're ill-prepared and under-equipped for those kinds of weather situations. One of the men is a Christian, the other one's an atheist. And in this moment, the atheist prays with the Christian, and the Christian prays, God, please, somehow, help us, save us, pull us out of this situation. Not 30 minutes later, a man on a snowmobile comes by, rescues both the men. Later that same night, they're at the restaurant, warming up and eating. And the Christian looks at the atheist and says, man, isn't God good? Notice how he answered our prayer and saved us. And the atheist said, what are you talking about? God didn't save us. The man on the snowmobile did. Notice the difference. The Christian sees the providence of God at work. We prayed. God saved us. How? He didn't reach down and pluck us out of the snow. In his providence, through circumstances and people, we were there at the right place at the right time by the grace of God. I'm afraid sometimes as Christians, we're too much like that atheist. And we think God's going to help us, but it wouldn't be through somebody else. It wouldn't be through a situation or a circumstance. It would be through some grand event. But when we pray to God and ask for help, don't don't be surprised if he helps us through a person, through a situation. And we have to say this, sometimes we're the person lost in the snow, but sometimes we're the person on the snowmobile. Sometimes you are a Ruth, but sometimes you are a Boaz. What does that mean? If you've been blessed by God, like Boaz has been blessed by God, God did not bless you for you to keep it all to yourself. God blessed you so that he could use you to bless somebody else. That's the way he works. We see that with Boaz. Hey, the Lord bless you. The Lord be with you. But I'm going to do my part. I'm going to use what I have to do just that. We see that there's no hoarding in the kingdom of God. You might just be the person God uses to answer the prayer of the person sitting on the pew next to you. And may it be the case. God, look after us like you did for Ruth. Help us to be a Boaz and use what you've blessed us with to bless others. It continues. We see more of this. In the next place, we see the provision. So not just the providence, the right people, right place, right time, but we see the provision of divine protection. God's taking care of Ruth. Is she going to have just enough or is she going to have an abundance? Notice Ruth chapter 2, verses 14 through 18 with me, if you would. Ruth chapter 2, 14 through 18. And this section of scripture begins with Boaz going above and beyond what was required of him under the law of Moses. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. Notice this statement. This says so much about God. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. 
She went there hungry. She didn't just get enough to feed herself. She had leftovers. When she arose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out from some of the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. The law of Moses said they could glean on the edges of the fields. Boaz says, Let Ruth get the best of the crop. Verse 17, So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. I don't know about you. I don't know what an ephah is. I don't, I don't go to Publix and buy an ephah of anything. I looked it up. An ephah is about 30 to 50 pounds. Scholars say that this would have been 10 days worth of food. Imagine going to Publix and buying 10 days worth of food. That's what God blessed Ruth with through Boaz. Verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over from being satisfied. Notice God provides for Ruth and Naomi, but how does he do it? First, he provides for Boaz with an abundant harvest. Boaz, out of his desire to follow the heart of God, provides for Ruth the best of the crop, enough to eat, and some leftovers. Ruth could have scurried those leftovers away. She could have hid them for herself. She goes home and shares it with Naomi. Notice, people who see their blessings as coming from God and not from themselves use it for the benefit of others. And we see God blessing three people here, and they all use their blessings to bless somebody else. One of the great lessons that we need to gain from this section of Scripture is that God provides enough to satisfy with leftovers. God provides enough to satisfy with leftovers. Look at when Boaz invites her to have a seat at the table, which really there's no reason for her to. She's a foreigner. She doesn't work for him. He doesn't know at this time that they're related through law, but he invites her to have a seat at the table. And you might think, well, maybe they'll give me the crumbs like a dog. No, she gets to eat enough to satisfy herself after working all day and some to take home to her mother-in-law. I want to notice some of the divine provision that God showers upon Ruth through Boaz and how God does the same for us. In the first place, Ruth gets invited to the meal with a seat at the table. That was honor. For her to sit among those men and to be able to eat was an honorable thing. Secondly, Ruth is able to eat until satisfied. She's not chastised when she goes for more to eat until she's full. Third, Ruth is able to have some left over. And then lastly, Ruth is able to glean the best spots. She doesn't have to go around the corners like the law of Moses provided, but she's able to go to the best spots and get in abundance. What I want us to see is spiritually, as Christians who obey Jesus Christ and accept his invitation, we are Ruth. And Boaz is what God has done through Christ. Brothers and sisters, we don't deserve a seat at the table in the kingdom of God. Jesus gives a parable in Luke 14, verse 21, where there's a master who's giving a great banquet. And the people who are originally invited to the banquet, you know the parable maybe, all give lame excuses for why they can't make it. What does the master of the house say? I want my house to be filled. He tells his servants, go to the highways, the byways, the hedges. The people you wouldn't expect to eat at my table, that's the people I want to eat at my table. Brothers and sisters, that's you and me. <laughs> I don't deserve a seat at God's table, but I'm invited anyway. Why? God wants to see his house filled. Just like Ruth, I don't deserve to be there, but by the grace of God and through the blood of Christ, I am. Like Ruth, we are starving, maybe not physically, but certainly spiritually. And though I can't, I don't have the resources to be fulfilled spiritually, God gives me enough plus leftovers. Think about what Jesus says in John 6, verse 35, where he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Just like Ruth getting enough to be satisfied, God gives us, when we're spiritually hungry, through Jesus, enough to be satisfied. More than that, we're able to glean the best God has to offer. Ruth wasn't just given the edges of the field, she was given the main portion. You know, when God blesses us as his children through Jesus Christ, he gives us the best he has to offer. Every spiritual blessing, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3, in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
We even have a harvest. We have a field we can work in. Jesus told his disciples, John 4, verse 35, Do not see, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And just like Ruth, we're rewarded with this harvest of souls when we work for Jesus. In John 4, verse 36, he says, The one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. Ruth gleaned for physical life. We get to glean for eternal life. And like Ruth, we're given in abundance. Remember what Jesus tells his followers in John chapter 10, verse number 10. I came that my sheep may have life and have it abundantly, more abundantly. Right? What is Jesus giving us? He's not giving us the bare minimum. He's not scraping the bottom of the barrel for his children. He's giving us enough to be satisfied and leftovers, just like God through Boaz gave to Ruth. And we need to, I think, learn a great lesson from Ruth that we should look for opportunities to bless others with what God has blessed us with. When God gives us enough to be satisfied and leftovers, he expects us to use those leftovers to be a blessing to others. In fact, we read in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 11, in the context of giving, in the context of the contribution, the Bible tells us, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Why is God blessing us? So that we can sit on it, so that we can waste it, so that we can do nothing with it? Or is God blessing us so that we can be generous, just like Boaz, just like Ruth? That's the thing about God. When he blesses, he doesn't just give us enough. He gives us enough with leftovers. Think about Jesus feeding the 5,000. We're familiar with that account. We know it's miraculous how Jesus prayed over that young lad's lunch. And it turned in enough to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. Part of the story we sometimes skip over is when they go around and they gather the leftovers after everybody ate enough to be full. You see, God could have just gave enough just for everybody to get what they needed. God knows what people need, but God didn't do that. He blessed them with enough to eat plus enough to collect in baskets when it was all said and done. The question for us is, what will we do with our leftovers. If God has blessed us and we have enough for us to have what we have and we have some left over, are we metaphorically taking that leftover to that widow Naomi and helping her so that she can have something to eat? Or are we doing something else with it? We read in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 a prayer from Paul that God will give us sufficiency in all things so that we may have an abundance, notice this, for every good work. If we have an abundance, why did God give us an abundance? So that we could be prepared for every good work. If God's blessed us and given us leftovers, let's use the leftovers to help somebody else, to help his kingdom, to help grow the church. In Ruth, we see that God wants to give to others through us, just as he gave to us through others. How many of us here have been helped through somebody else? Boaz could say that. Ruth could say that. Sometimes God's saying it's our turn to return the favor. One of the things we see in Ruth, and especially in the life of Boaz, that it just really jumps out to me is this, and then we'll move on. When a person believes that he is responsible for his own success, he often becomes stingy. If I think that this is a scarcity, that what I have, I got it, and it could be gone tomorrow, which is true, but it's all on me. God didn't help me. I got this myself. I need to hang on to it with a clenched fist because it's up to me to keep it. But if somebody sees what they have as the blessings of God, they know that even if they use what they have to give away to somebody else, they trust God to give them more. Boaz understood Sure, my, my, will my harvest be a little lighter this year because I'm letting this widow glean the best of the fields? Maybe. Can I afford to give away 30 to 50 pounds extra a day? I don't know. I haven't crunched Boaz's numbers. But I believe that Boaz believed that whatever he gave away to Ruth, he would get back from God. I believe Ruth believed, yeah, I could eat these leftovers for myself. I could save them for a snack tomorrow. But I believe that if I use them to help my widowed mother-in-law, that God will give me more. Brothers and sisters, may we trust God to provide for us abundantly and when we have an abundance, not just sit on it, not just wait on it, but use it to help others. 
It's been my experience. I'm not talking about in the church, but there are many who are sitting on so much money, on so much time, on so much resources, because they forgot that those things don't belong to them, they belong to God. But when we remember that those things belong to God, we can use them like Boaz, we can use them like Ruth. God provides enough to satisfy with leftovers. Lastly, we're going to see the plan of divine protection. We're going to start seeing all the strings come together where God is working on this story to bring Ruth and Boaz together, to bring forth the line of Jesse from which David comes, from which Jesus, our Savior, comes. Look at Ruth chapter 2, verses 19 through 23 with me, if you would. Ruth 2, 19 through 23. Ruth comes home and her mother-in-law says to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Naomi understood it wasn't necessarily had to be positive. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Remember, Ruth doesn't know the relation to Boaz and Naomi. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness, that's that Hebrew word we looked at last week, has said, steadfast love, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi said to her, This man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Notice how Naomi's bitterness starts to melt already. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. In other words, hey, you've got a job here now. You can glean this much every day. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with, this, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Notice God providing for Ruth and Naomi through Boaz. Not only that, but protecting her. Notice what Naomi says, Glad you were with Boaz, lest in another man's field you be assaulted. You can't take safety for granted, especially not back then. But God worked it all out. Notice the plan of divine protection. What I want us to gain from this is God is always working towards something good. We have to let God define good when we talk about God working towards something good. But God is always working towards something good. If you stop reading in Ruth chapter 1, this doesn't seem like a happy story. You've got a famine. You've got three widows. You've got the loss of husbands and sons. You've got a return to home with nothing but shame and bitterness. If you stop reading in Ruth 1, you have to conclude, man, maybe God has forsaken these people. And there's no doubt that's what Naomi felt when you read her own words. But chapter 2 reveals... That unbeknownst to Naomi and Ruth, God is providentially orchestrating something greater than anything Ruth and Naomi could have thought about. Not only will they be provided for, but it's through Ruth and Boaz that the Messiah will come. But she just happens to work in the field of one of her and Naomi's redeemers. What does that mean, redeemer? I want to read this for you. Redeemer refers to a kinship term. It denotes the near relative who is responsible for the economic well-being of a relative, and he comes into play especially when the relative is in distress and cannot get himself slash herself out of the crisis. And this is an uh, Old Testament principle guided by certain laws in the law of Moses. But the point is that everything coalesces and works together from God's perspective, and it's beginning to come together here in chapter number 2. That God does not leave his people high and dry. That God provides for those and works to provide for those who have nobody to provide for them. That we do serve a good God who is always working towards something good. And we see in Ruth, especially chapter 2, when man is, has nothing left to do but guess, God is working on how he's going to bless. Ruth and Naomi don't know where it's going to come from. They don't know if they could even find Boaz. But God orchestrates it all. It reminds me of another famine in Genesis, especially chapter number 50, where God sends a famine on the land, but he sends ahead of the famine, he sends Joseph. How does Joseph get to Egypt? Well, through the treachery of his brothers, through slavery, through false imprisonment. 
And through all of that, which we look at and say, man, that's horrible, that's bad. God uses all that for the salvation of an entire nation, from which eventually comes Jesus Christ. That's why Joseph was able to say to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, what you did, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And we see that in the lives of Ruth and Naomi. We know what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, how God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We see that with Ruth and Naomi. We can read in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, the Apostle Paul telling us that this light momentary affliction isn't worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory that's waiting for us. Yes, it might be difficult now. There is loss. There is loneliness. There is sojourning. There is famine. But God is working on something way better than we can imagine. If you are a child of God, you have this divine protection. God's looking out for you. God and his providence and his planning and his provision is providing for you. And our role is small. God does the lion's share, but we do have a role. We must trust God to provide and plan and use his providence on our behalf. God is in the providing business. That's who he is. We need to be in the trusting business and trust that God will do what he said. A twofold invitation for us in the lesson is yours. One, we we'll invite you to work in God's field and share in the abundance that he gives you. We need to work in God's field as Christians in evangelism. Jesus said the fields are white for harvest, that there is a reward for when we reap and for when we glean. Brothers and sisters, let's not forget that. Let's remember that God isn't blessing us just for us to sit on our hands. And how we steward the blessings that God provides us tells us if he's going to bless us again in the future. If we're working in God's field as one of God's children, let's use the abundance he blesses us with to bless others. Secondly, I hope that you will accept your invitation to sit at God's table. There might be some here tonight who have never responded to the Lord's invitation, who have never obeyed the gospel. What God is doing through his son, Jesus Christ, is being very honest with us. We don't deserve a seat at God's table. We can't choose to join God's kingdom, but we can be added to it if we accept the Lord's invitation. Maybe you've been to a wedding and you go there. And you go to a wedding and there'll be tables that are set up with little name cards in front of each seat. Maybe you've been to something like that. I, it always boggles my mind when you go to a wedding and you go to an empty seat and you got those name cards where somebody should have been sitting, but they didn't make it. And you always have to wonder, why weren't they there? There might be a name card in front of a seat in the kingdom of God that has your name on it. And as of now, that seat is empty. And we have to be wondering, why aren't you there? Why haven't you responded to the invitation? God is calling you out of shame and dishonor and to honor and glory through his son, Jesus Christ. Won't you accept that invitation? You don't deserve to be there, but you've got a seat with your name on it. Praise God. May we learn from Ruth and Boaz and his care for them both. And if anybody, if anybody uh, like Ruth is being invited to have a seat at God's table today, and you haven't done it yet, I hope you will, by putting on his son Jesus Christ in baptism. May we remember these lessons. May we depend on God, trusting that he will take care of us, and what he gives us, let's use to take care of others. If you have a need to come forward, if you've been convicted by God's word, I hope you will while we stand and sing this song.